Uh, so we're talking about Fruitvale Follies, and this is the original spelling of Fruitvale here in Oakland. Uh, and six generations of tinkerers and scientists in various failed experiments in this great town. So uh, just to get us started, you may have absolutely no idea where Fruitvale is. It's a part of Oakland. It's probably a part of Oakland you don't frequent very often. Uh, but you know, it's cool, it's there. We're up here. I think I have a pointer. Yep, I do, awesome. So why are we talking about Fruitvale? Uh, that's a really great question. It's kind of interesting for a couple reasons. It was one of the last areas to get incorporated into what we think of as Oakland today. It used to produce a lot of fruit, hence the name. So they you know, had orchards of various cherries and citrus and that sort of thing. These days, it's pretty much known for crime. Uh, this is a two-month snapshot of the neighborhood. Uh, but really, we're talking about it because I have a story, and it's set there. And it starts like most stories in kind of modern California with, once upon a time, someone found gold in California. And it convinced this guy, uh, who's named Alfred Andrew Cohen, and these folks, the Brays, to move on out here from the East Coast and risk cholera and oxen to make the journey. To make it rich. And uh, just to give a really quick overview of who these people are and why I care about them, and I don't know whether you'll ever care about them, but why I do. Uh, so Alfred Andrew uh, actually was born in England. He didn't come over by oxen. That was a lie. Uh, I just said I never lie, but apparently that's not true. So uh, he was hanging out in Jamaica. Uh, he, he was around 16 years old at that point. He'd left England at 14 by himself. And the gold rush happened, and he was like, that sounds like a good idea. So he came through the Panama Canal moved here, uh, tried a whole bunch of things, got really rich doing them, married this woman, Emily Gibbons, and built himself a palatial mansion in what is now Alameda. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Emily was actually uh, from an older family of Quakers who were here in San Francisco a little bit before the gold rush. So that's also kind of cool. They had a son also named Alfred, uh, Alfred Henry Cohen. Now the Brays uh, also came from the east side of uh, the world. Uh, they were in New Jersey, and they came out here to uh, be merchants because actually mining for gold was not a terribly good way to make a fortune. So uh, they got quite rich as well and built themselves a really big house in, uh, in Fruitvale, which is part of why we're talking about this. Their daughter, Emma, who is who I'm named for, it's a little sneak peek, uh, married Alfred, and uh, for her, their wedding present, Emma's parents built them a really big house uh, right next door. So this was the house they moved into, and his parents uh, furnished it for them. They had a da daughter, Marion. Uh, she married this guy, Charles Gilliland, and they moved into the house next door again. They had a daughter, Nancy, uh, who got married to the minister's son and moved all the way to Berkeley. Uh, they had a daughter, Patricia, who moved into the house next door again. <laughs> and that is where me and my sister were born. So that's how all of these people are related to me. Now, lucky for my family, or unlucky, depending on how you feel about sitting on nonprofit boards, uh, this woman, Emilita, was Emma and Alfred's youngest daughter. And she lived to the age of 90 and never married and stayed in the house her whole life. Uh, and so it is now an existing historic landmark in Oakland. And all of the interiors are exactly the same. And actually, the current caretaker in residence is with us in the audience today, uh, which is kind of exciting. So because of all of that, we have a lot of history based in this town. Uh, and it turns out, and I was doing research for this, that a lot of the history of the United States can actually be told through the history of Oakland. It's really a microcosm, except for you know all those things that can't. But we're not really going to talk about those. So the things that can be told through Oakland, I, mean, I think there are a lot of really interesting ones that I came across through my family. Uh, immigration was obviously a really big story. These are just some of the countries that we've come from. Child mortality was actually a really big deal. Uh, there were a lot of lost kids. This is actually Mountain View Cemetery, uh, which is another really big part of Oakland history the kind of how land use was done in cemeteries. Uh, interior decorating, people might not think this is that big a deal, but it's actually pretty cool. Uh, these are interiors of, of the house that, that uh, is still here, by the way. Uh, changing neighborhoods. So this is a picture of Oak Tree Farm, uh, you know, back around 18... 60 or so, maybe 1870. Uh, this is the neighborhood now, uh, kind of almost the same view. It's looking at the house, would have been the side of the house. So this picture, this street here, would have been this side street over here. Um, so you can tell it's urbanized a lot. 
Uh, this is the original map of when the Faley was here. This is the oak tree farm plot. This is where the house that's still standing is. The rest of uh, Watson Bray's property is all around here. This is Sather's property, who gave Sather Gate to Berkeley. Uh, and this is kind of what the map looks like now. So you can see the Fruitvale BART station it's here, Fruitvale Avenue, Foothill Boulevard. Again, you probably don't hang out in this part of Oakland, so this probably doesn't mean very much to you. It's fine. Uh, we had some incest, which is always fun. So uh, John and Susanna Bray in 1716, uh, well, that was when he was born. They had two kids, Andrew Bray and James Bray, who politely named their children after their parents. So one of them had a son, John. The other one had a daughter, Susanna, who then got married and had their own son, John. First cousins wasn't that weird in the 1700s, though. The fact that some of the second and third cousins have had to hook up since is a little bit stranger, but we're not going to go there. Uh, education for women was a big thing. Mills College was a, a, a huge advancement in women's education, and we uh, had a lot of family members that went there. Natural disasters and how everyone responded to that. I think some of the stories coming out after the 1906 earthquake are, are really touching. Um, this one was actually Alfred Andrew Cohen's railroad station that uh, fell down in 1868, so that, that was a personal one for us. And this is a newspaper that we still have in the house, which isn't that old, but trust me, we have some older ones. Uh, love, I think, is one of the great stories that you can always find in, in history. So uh, all kinds of love. These are my grandparents. These are my parents. Uh, another set of grandparents. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is actually my my uh, cousin once removed in 1961, uh, I believe she wrote that she's been going with her boyfriend for nine months and she's really excited about it. And then she wrote again that they'd broken up after a year and a half, and then, uh, <laughs> which was kind of sad. And then her sister is right next, next to it uh, 40 years later when she finally got married for the first time, which I thought was really charming. Anyway, so love, war, uh, you know, is, is a big part of any story. This is my grandfather in World War I. This is the unexpected heir to the family fortune in World War II. Apparently, we don't have very many people that watch that TV show in this audience. Uh, poor name choices. I think every family has these. Don't name your child Hildred. It's just not a good idea. Animal husbandry. You know, it was a rural kind of community. This is my grandfather hanging out with a hedgehog. Uh, baby boomer divorce rates is kind of a, a big one for me. So this is a whole bunch of my family here up to my great grandmother. And these, these are all of their failed divorces. <laughs> but what I think is really, really interesting, both from my perspective uh, as, as an engineer and scientist, and also uh, for this particular crowd of Nerd Night, is the scientists and tinkerers that we've had over the years. Um, and so starting kind of early, we had uh, my great, 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 grandfather. Uh, Dr. Henry Gibbons uh, was Emily Gibbons' father, and he was the first recorder of meteorological data here in San Francisco and one of the founding members of the Natural uh, Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, Alfred Andrew Cohen, as we already mentioned, uh, built a railroad. Uh, he built a railroad that went from Hayward to the edge of Alameda and then a ferry service over to the rest of San Francisco uh, that was really later bought by the, the large railroad tycoons, the big four. Medicine, uh, this is, I'm particularly proud of this. This is my grandmother founded the Department of Medif Medical Photography at Herrick. Um, so it's my grandfather, my grandmother, and my mother from graduating from nursing school in 72. Uh, what I think is really interesting is how short their skirts were. Uh, but anyway, uh, early computers, I think, is always an interesting one for this neighborhood. So uh, my I, great uncles, I believe, is how uh, these people were related to me. I'm getting a nod from my cousin once removed in the back here. Uh, had this electronic shop in their in their in the back of the big house that that it still is with us today. And they built a whole bunch of really interesting electronic equipment. They had a bunch of contracts with NASA Ames in the 50s. Um, so that's great. The story that really, really caught my attention was my great-grandfather's obsession with, uh, with wireless telegraphy, or otherwise known as radio. And I think that this is one of the great stories because radio has been uh, such a grabber of attention for tinkerers throughout history. You know, kind of since it, it formed, it was a group of amateurs that really got going with it. Marconi, Marconi the, the kind of father of radio, arguably, depending on whether you choose Tesla or Logicide, whatever, uh, was an amateur, really knew nothing about physics. Uh, and it's one of those great kind of things, because you can get into it as an amateur, but there's so much to learn about it, and it just keeps going and going. So uh, I don't know a lot about how 
uh, Alfred Henry Cohen got into radio, but I can only imagine that uh, one of the things that kind of sparked his interest was in 1899, uh, one of the first big trials of radio was uh, the broadcast of the America's Cup, which we're all hearing about again now. Uh, but the America's Cup was being held in New York, and the the big thing was uh, Marconi took a ship out and followed the races around and, and radioed the results back to shore in New York, and then they were telegraphed all over the country so that everyone had up to the minute uh, information. And so this is actually a picture of the, the newspaper, The Call, in uh, San Francisco had a big canvas up on their building, and they had people up here moving the boats around as they got updated information on what was happening. So here in San Francisco, everyone was watching the America's Cup race happen in San Francisco, and it was the first time this could ever happen. Uh, and it was really exciting. So I, I can only imagine that being in Oakland at the time, that this was something that, that caught his attention and got him really excited. And just to think about what was kind of happening in his life at 1899. Um, you know, his father, Alfred Andrew Cohen, had moved from England alone at 14, uh, dabbled in a huge range of activities and made a huge fortune by building a railroad, selling it to the big four, becoming their chief counsel, and then he built himself this palatial mansion. Uh, Alfred Henry Cohen, he, he went to Harvard. He had a mediocre law career that he kind of didn't like very much, as far as I can tell. He was happily married with four children, and he lived less than five miles from home. So um, even his beard was a little bit less impressive in a lot of ways. So he became really obsessed with radio. And I, I can only imagine that this was kind of, he thought this was going to be his, his invention. You know, He thought he was going to live up to his dad's true worth. Uh, and just so we have a little bit of context about what was going on in California at the time, it's not like it was actually that isolated. So uh, in 1960, the Pony, uh, or 1860, excuse me there, 1860, the Pony Express uh, got initiated, and this shortened the mail route uh, down to, to 10 days, which is ridiculous. They just had guys literally galloping horses across the country. It's amazing. Um, but in 1861, the telegraph line was put across, and so you had almost instant communication with the East Coast. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad had already been completed, in great thanks to the, the Big Four and, and actually Alfred's father. Um, and the first telephone conversation had already happened here. So, so radio wasn't exactly you know, it wasn't this huge revolution. It wasn't that you could reach places that you hadn't been able to reach distance-wise um, before. But it did hold a lot of promise. And, and those promises were related to a couple of things. They were, uh, it was rapid communication to places that couldn't have a static telegraph line. So ships, trains, um, the emerging idea of automobiles, those were all really big ideas about what radio was going to enable. And for uh, a merchant town like San Francisco, that's really important. Even knowing that your, your boat's going to come in you know, within 24 hours changes vastly waiting for it to come through Panama and having no idea when it was going to arrive. That, that really changed commerce. Um, and then the concept of personal wireless communication, which is actually one that I really love. So here are some choice quotes that I found from the early 1900s. Um, the Los Angeles Times reports in 1901 that someday men and women will carry wireless telephones as today we carry a card case or a camera. And you can imagine what their cameras looked at, like at that time. So. Um, in 1902, Marconi himself said, uh, the system is handy a thing for automobiles in general. I had a breakdown in England and was able to send a wireless message to my base asking them to, uh, that dinner be kept hot. On another trip, I thought two English policemen were after me, and I was able to notify friends to be ready to bail me out if the Bobbies should catch up with me. Um, so already they were thinking of the amazing things that they would be enabled to do with personal wireless communication. Also in 1902, uh, this is one of my personal favorites, uh, the Cosmopolitan says, obviously the dif difficulties of chaperonage are going to be tremendously increased. The young man on the 20th floor of a Broadway building will be subjected not only to the charms of the stenographer's elbow, but to those of the stenographer in the upper stories of all the high buildings round about. So, you know, how was personal communication going to change flirting and uh, relationships and that sort of thing? And this is actually a picture of a man being uh, wirelessly radioed by his wife to remember to pick something up at the grocery store um, from that 1902 paper, which I think is kind of fabulous. So there were some really thorny issues, and we're back to pictures of my grandfather with the, the porcupine there. Um, Distance was a big one, though the less necessary for kind of the, the communication that people were thinking about in terms of personal communication. The distance was really for ships. How far into the water could you get that wireless uh, 
transmission. Energy requirements, uh, the original type of transmitters required a huge amount of energy to be able to travel that distance. Um, and that got changed over the years. And then reliability issues. You, you'd have a system that worked one day and it wouldn't work the next day. And if it got a little damp, something would blow up. I mean, there were just lots of problems, um, which made it a, a ripe field for both hackers and amateurs. Uh, so one of my favorite things is it only, uh, this was four years after the original America's Cup success. The 1903 America's Cup was a total epic disaster for Marconi and uh, radio because he had been claiming that he had a system that made his wireless tunable so that no one could interfere with it and it wouldn't interfere with other stations. And uh, these guys uh, didn't believe him and so they sent out really strong signals from shore that totally swamped his entire broadcast and uh, they received Instead of receiving reports of the position of the yachts, they got a lot of meaningless gabble varied by harsh obscenity, profanity, and sentimental poetry. <laughs> uh, so this was one of the early hacks in uh, technology. I'm not saying it's the first by any means, but uh, I thought it was a pretty good one. Uh, and one of the, so kind of what was going on at the time, technically, and I won't spend a ton of time on this both because I don't think I actually have a ton of time, and frankly, well, this science I get, some of the later stuff I, I'm going to have to read more on. But um, the general idea is that you had a power, oh, wrong, you had a power source here that would charge up this capacitor, and when it got to a high, high enough voltage, it would break down, it would cross the breakdown voltage of this here and ionize the air and create a circuit that went across here and created uh, electricity, which induced an antenna to send out a wave. Um, and that would happen a lot of times, because as soon as it discharged, this gap would stop sparking and uh, it would turn off and then it would charge again and it would do it again and again and again. So while you were holding down your telegraph key, you were providing electricity and as soon as you let it off, it would go away. But this caused a lot of problems because the signal, oh, I keep doing that, looked something like this. And you can see here it's a damped oscillation, which means not only the amplitude goes down, but the frequency changes as time goes on here. So between each spark, you got this wave that changed in frequencies and it kind of covered the entire range of, of frequencies. So it was great if you only had like one, but if you tried to have like a couple in the same area, they just totally swamped each other. There was no way to, to tune it around each other. And then the receivers were kind of interesting too. They had um, these things called coherers, I don't actually know how to pronounce it, but basically they had this little tube that had metal filings in it, and when it picked up a signal, it would cause the metal filings to form a continuous connection and transmit electricity, but then you had to knock the thing to make them disconnect again to be able to pick up the next signal. So they developed this really ingenious little knocker that would like dislodge the metal filings between each signal that happened like a second apart. It was clever, but it was not really sustainable. Um, and part of this is their understanding of the science at the time was approximately this. There was one uh, box, be it black or otherwise, uh, transmitting to another one, and it sometimes put out Morse code. And I'm not saying that there weren't scientists that understood electromagnetic radiation at the time, but they certainly weren't the ones working on, on the wireless stuff. Uh, mostly this was just amateurs. Um, who were experimenting and trial and error. Uh, and it was it was open to trial and error, but that particular system required a lot of electricity to transmit over any distance. So it was kind of open to rich amateurs because you needed to have your own source of electricity, which Alfred did put in a generator in uh, the back shop uh, some 20 years <laughs> before they actually electrified the house, which I think shows some of his priorities. Uh, so now, luckily, we know a lot more about uh, the electromagnetic system. We know that Google's sinister projects are over here, um, Slinkies are over here, and the, the area that they were uh, working on was in radio, so ham radio and kosher radio being obviously big parts of that system. Um, yeah. So. Advances that, that Alfred was probably working on at the time, uh, in fact, we know he was, were transmitting voice uh, amplification and tuning. And so things like amplification let you reduce the power that re were required both for the transmitter at the beginning, there was no power on the receiver side. So on the transmitter side, um, you could have a lower energy there if you were able to do amplification. Tuning, again, was important because you wanted to be able to have a lot of people communicating in the same area. Uh, and so they came up with a couple really interesting things, including crystal receivers, uh, which involved an actual piece of galena, which uh, was a natural diode. It only transmitted electricity in one direction. And so it was able to do this to a uh, frequency. So it would take the radio frequency 
uh, cut off the negative side of it, and you were able to uh, pull out voice transmission. This was really important for being able to do things other than Morse code because it allowed. Um, this is actually what AM radio looks like. So amplification modification is what this is. You take your your wave that you're transmitting everything on, and then overlay it with the wave of the actual voice or noise that you want to transmit, and then your receiver is able to pull that out on the other side using this kind of early diode from crystal receivers. Um, and then the next thing after that were these much more advanced diodes and triodes, uh, which were in vacuum tubes, which is what Alfred was really passionate about in probably the 1920s. Uh, so he wasn't exactly Marconi Jr. There's not a lot of uh, evidence of, of how far he got in this. He was one of several uh, radio operators in the Bay Area at the time. But this is a couple hints. So this is actually a newspaper article from 1914. Um, where the Mayor Mott and Mayor Rolf um, of San Francisco and Oakland uh, talked to each other, sort of, from the Fairmont Hotel um, to uh, the 1440 29th Avenue property, which is this house that still exists today. Um, and they didn't actually quite talk to each other because they got their timing off, and one of them had already left by the time the other one got there. But they both spoke and heard things, so it kind of counted. Uh, and this is kind of a big deal, because 1914 was actually pretty early for this. Uh, voice uh, transmission was, was not super far along at this point. Uh, and he also was listed in uh, the Radio Service Bulletin of 1921 along with the Westinghouse Electric Manufacturing Company, so I feel like that's a pretty good competition to be up against. Um, so he clearly was making some progress, was really passionate about it. At this time, he was one of about 34 people uh, who had licenses in the Bay Area. Unfortunately, he managed to uh, blow himself up, basically, while trying to make a vacuum tube. Uh, so it, there was a fair amount of uh, various different solvents involved in the process, and he managed to ignite some of them and cause himself really severe burns. Uh, and he didn't die immediately, but it seriously hurt his health, and he died a couple years later. So it wasn't the most successful story of tinkering in our family, but I, I did think it was an interesting one. Uh, to this day, I, I don't know if he would be a little chagrined, but the, the TV in the kitchen, and this is a reenactment because we didn't get an actual picture of this, but the, the reception still has rabbit ears with foil on it, so he might be slightly embarrassed about that. But I think he would be happy to know that wireless has come so far that I was able to receive this text from my sister this morning who lives in Spain that said, I just saw a nun in a lingerie shop, and it must be a good sign. Um, so I, you know, I think he would be proud to know that it, he was part of the, the science that made this particular communication possible. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the, the main part of that story. And I just, you know, for, for us, the family motto is kind of basically, if you keep it long enough, it becomes history. Uh, and <laughs> So, you know, I, I really encourage you. The house is still here. It's a historic landmark. It's something that we share. There are tours. Um, this is just so you can see uh, the 1915 uh, Panama Pacific International Exposition book, which we have upstairs. This is the workshop in the back that uh, my, my cousin was kind enough to take me through. It has an incredible array of historical machines. This is a newspaper from 1875. Anyway, there's lots of fun stuff in there. It's a great treasure, um, and I want to give special thanks to, to Ken Gilliland for family history, uh, Florian for helping me take pictures, and my mom for just being awesome. <laughs>